<laughs> I'm Liz Altieri, and this is Karen Douglas. Um, and we are uh, professors at Radford University, but we are also co-directors along with our colleague, Darren Manarek of the uh, Virginia Inclusive Practices Center at Radford University. We have been working with um, several school divisions to improve their practice, their inclusive practice. And we have another school division who wants to actually work with us for the next three years. We're really excited about that. Um, so you don't need to know much more about us other than um, this, is, this is what we know. We've both worked with students in the adapted curriculum. And, um, and so we'll just get started. All right. So just as a reminder, as what you've heard in previous sessions and um, even just the prior session of when we talk inclusion, we're really talking about not just the physical inclusion, which is where we've been, but we also want to make sure that we're getting that academic inclusion and that social emotional inclusion. So we're going to provide strategies for all three areas and um, that are just kind of those best practices in, in moving forward or being even more inclusive than schools and classrooms currently are. Before we do that, um, just very, very quickly, um, how many of you are parents who have a child with a disability? How many that are currently in school right now? Okay. How about uh, how many have a child who is in Included at least part of the day right now. Oh boy, a little bit. Okay. Do we have any teachers in the group? Okay, one. You give that dual role. Um, okay. And um, advocates, support people. Okay, great. Terrific. So, um, you know, we, as somebody said before, we do days worth on this. So we're going to do it very quickly, plus our time is, is somewhat shortened, um, but inclusive practice isn't just an inclusion classroom. This is the inclusive classroom. Inclusive practice is a school that has a commitment to changing the culture, to collaboration, um, and to actually improving their practice. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on that, but these are some of the collaboration pieces that have to happen when we really hoping for inclusive practice to improve. Um, we know that how the IEP is written is one of the key elements. That would make a good session here, I think. How to write IEPs that promote inclusion. That's an idea for next year. That, Kathy's um, section, <laughs> session next at four o'clock, if you want to go in this room, I think. Um, so yeah, just we have to share that information. Um, we have to make sure the general educator and the paraprofessional in the classroom and the special educator, they're all aware of, um, you know, what are the IEP goals? What are the accommodations? What are medical and behavioral needs? Um, and so we have to make sure that we provide that information in addition to making sure we're addressing those academic and social objectives. So with physical access, we want our students, our, our, your own children to be in proximity of their peers. Um, that, that is key. And I will tell you from lots of my experience being in the classroom, whether I'm there to observe, whether I'm the classroom teacher, you know, when the, because um, the next one is, you know, making sure they're not all at the same table by themselves and thinking about that proximity to the teacher, if the teacher is right next to the student with a disability all the time, do the peers want to come talk? No. Do they want to come hang out? No. So we have to teach the general educator, the paraprofessional, even the special educator too, that you know we can go and intervene when necessary. We can go provide suggestions, but we don't need to be standing there and sitting there all the time because when the adult backs away, that opens up the door for the peers to come interact. To, to socialize, to even provide support that's more natural than having a teacher right there. So really thinking about that proximity to peers, proximity to teacher, bell to bell. How many of your students that are, are in the general education 
environment, are they there for the whole class period? Excellent, hopefully, hopefully they are. Hopefully they're not coming five minutes late. Yeah. Um, and to write IP goals so that, for example, we're including schools, we're including what their location needs to be in the classroom. Yeah. And the key with that bell to bell is, you know, so they're not missing out, A, on that little bit of social time at the beginning of a class, um, and to teach them kind of real world of, you know, I've heard a lot of teachers, oh, well, the schools are so crowded and the hallways are crowded. My student's going to get knocked over or whatever. But that's real world. Like we don't, we can't, you know, make that accommodation out on the street, out on the boardwalk at Virginia Beach at nighttime, you know, when there's lots of people. So we have to teach them how to navigate these busy hallways. Um, and, and so that's where that bell to bell is important. Access, of course, we want to make sure that they don't just have their communication device, but it's actually being used and, and being taught how to be used. Um, but but we do want to make sure it's there and not just on the shelf or on the side of the classroom. Um, and then thinking about when we need, sometimes we need to take a break. Sometimes we need to calm down. But ideally, these are areas within the classroom. These are open to all kids in the classroom. We don't need to go to a different room to, again, to segregate and separate students. Just have a calming area with some bean bags and some places to hang out um, and, you know, to catch your breath and then to come back and work. But ideally within the classroom environment is um, best practice. The one thing we also know when we try to work with classroom teachers is to help them understand that these changes aren't just for this one student. These changes are going to help all the students in the class. We have lots of kids coming into school now with all kinds of trauma, and they need that moment. Yeah. And that's really a key piece that you can kind of take back is this is not just going to help my child that you're advocating for, but it's going to help all the kids in the classroom. So academic inclusion. Have you guys heard of UDL, Universal Design for Learning? So I'm just gonna kind of throw this up there and, and share, you know, again, real quick, that multiple representation, making sure that all of our lessons are represented in different formats. Like today, we have a PowerPoint visual. You, we gave you a handout. Um, we're verbalizing things. Um, you might add some pictures and some videos. Um, you might, for some kids, we might have to simplify the vocabulary. Um, we might have to shorten the lesson in some format. Um, engage. Um, engagement, of course, you know, we want everybody engaged. We want them doing hands-on learning. We want that integration of technology when appropriate or the integration of non-technology when appropriate. You know, when we were in the pandemic and we were Zooming and doing everything virtually, we really got into this computer. But now we're finding when we give students the option, do you want to do this on the, on the computer or on paper? They're choosing paper. You know, a lot of people are sick and tired of the computer, rightfully so. Um, so, so sometimes while technology is a great medium um, and can provide access for some people that um, normally wouldn't have it, um, we also want to provide those choices too and, and those options. Engagement. 
seldomly should we be doing whole group instruction like this. Um, ideally, it's small group, it's stations, it's parallel teaching half and half. Um, we don't necessarily need somebody in the front of the room talking all the time. Um, that's, that's not going to promote engagement of your students. And then lastly, being the expression piece of how do we know what our students are learning? They don't have to just sit and take a test. They can submit a project. They can do an oral presentation. They can do a video. There's lots of different ways they can demonstrate their knowledge and what they've learned. And so getting them to be able to express that is key. Okay. This is that expression piece of they can choose from these pictures of which ones to take the president and the principal. <laughs> um, so that's getting them to demonstrate that knowledge, but it's using different representations um, and engaging them in different ways. And our students all assumed that everybody would know what a beach was. And so the interesting thing is, even though we put sand in the bag for this one student on this particular, it was a 
And those are really ideas for all subject areas. You can find all sorts of adapted novels um, that are available. Um, I, and we're gonna show you at the end, there's a couple websites and stuff that will share a little bit more about that. Um, but here's a couple examples. Again, you can easily take these apart. You can recreate them. You could have Velcro on them. Um, and again, you, know, you could use something similar in high school to where you're breaking down, you know, I adapted books like Of Mice and Men for my students. I've done Harry Potter um, to where I, I created, basically they were PowerPoint slides that I turned into a book to where my students could read them and could, could gain the same knowledge. <clears throat> I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. You could do them either way. Yeah, I mean, it would be great activity to have your students make the books, but sometimes that opportunity is not available, so you might provide them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this was just kind of us talking about target student-wise, listening to the text when the students um, might be reading it aloud, and I can kind of make this even smaller too. Um, that way, practice is reading with an adapted book. This is the way your students, you know, students on the adapted curriculum might be interacting with the text. Um, having specific sight words, um, you know, maybe the whole class is learning 10 vocabulary words and your students learning five. They're still learning, they're still participating. Um, the adapted books can also help with fluency, for sure, and then using those picture choices to answer any comprehension questions are always a good idea. definition that's them being engaged you know in their class 
So another a way for what we call linguistic vocabulary structure that we know is useful for all students with disabilities at all in one body of work is that we need to speak each academic vocabulary as well, not just read aloud, but in all grade levels. So let's say we're doing a fourth grade unit, or this also happens to be seventh grade, I want to say is pollination. Okay. Um, and what we typically have is you'll hear teachers say, okay, who knows what pollination is? And a whole bunch of hands go up in the air. And the teacher comes on this person and they go, um, it's when there's pollen. No, not exactly. Who else knows what it is? Okay, so another way to do this. Um, so we would actually work in small groups. Every student would have, and for some students, we might do that little just glue on top of the letter so that we're adding some texture. And we use, and these are archers, what the instructions use. So they would say the word with us. We would spell the word together. We would say the word again. We would then show a picture of what pollination is. Everybody would have a set of these materials. Um, and then and then I would have a very short, simple, friendly definition of what pollination is. You know, it's when um, an animal or insect or weather brings pollen from one plant to another and it helps the plant make new plants, helps it make seeds and make new plants. Very simple definition. What's great about this is not only are we having them repeat this with us and we can teach it, we do a lot of what we call breakfast clubs in school. The students that we work with, then when the teacher does the actual lesson on pollination, they have their materials and they can pick up the word, I know what pollination is, okay? Or, you know, pick up, show me which picture is pollination. So we, we create lots of opportunities for kids to respond who don't have either the verbal abilities or who are not speaking or don't have enough vocabulary, even though they know what it is. So very simple kinds of materials still. Um, and then you can also kind of put them on the wall to where you can have a wall of vocabulary words and they can be something again, whether it's Velcro or magnets on a whiteboard to where students can go get the words and move the words and match the words with the definition. Um, they can do a variety of things. So I'm a big fan of, you know, you see walls and you see pretty stuff in classrooms and you're like, make it instructional, make them learning, make it station, you know, utilizing the wall space in the classroom. <clears throat> and then here's just a little bit more ideas. Um, and this is an example when um, we see a lot of schools, especially elementary, where special educators are trying to like do grades and they have to figure out how to do for reach, especially for students in things like science and social studies. And so what can happen though is they can be providing that special design instruction, explicit instruction of vocabulary, at, even if it's 10 minutes, is incredibly powerful. And then we were talking about adapted books and information. Newzilla is a great website to go check out with different reading levels for current news stories. Um, Tar Heel Reader, Cast Book Builder, same thing. They're, they're easy tools to utilize to get some of those adapted books and, and to get readings on different materials and different grade levels, reading levels. Um, and here's one other. This was taken from a book I'll show you at the end of um, our, our session. It's more than, uh, it's more than just being. And um, this has, again, more many free resources to check out too. So definitely look those up. And then again, here's a couple links. Um, it, and so these are part of her, just her website has tons of resources, yeah. but these are all on adapting text and resources. And you guys have the presentation, but it's also on the ARC website too for the conference. So if you want the actual links, there they are.
So that was kind of language arts ideas. Now we're going to share just a couple math ideas and um, so our session's a little short. We're going to kind of go quickly, but please, please feel free to ask any questions. Um, so thinking kind of fifth grade math, small groups, they're learning how to solve long division problems. Um, and so <clears throat> we have a student on adapted curriculum that's learning number recognition and one-to-one -one correspondence and how to use the calculator. So when the rest of the class, so we can't see our division sign there for some reason, but um, when everybody's learning this long division, well, what can our student on the adapted curriculum be doing? They can be naming each number. They can be matching and corresponding. They can be counting with the blocks um, in order to, to be participating. And then when, you know, the students in the group are finished, he can pull out his calculator and see if the, the students in his group are correct. So he's still doing long division, but it's with the calculator. Um, and he's interacting with his peers because he's checking his peers work to see if they're correct. Um, so again, multiple ways we can do things. Um, I love a variety of number sense routines of, you know, again, that engagement piece of getting buy-in. A lot of students don't like math. They're turned off by math to where, you know, if you provided them, hey, do you want the revenue from the parking lot sales at the concert coming up? Or do you want the concession sales? You know, and getting students talking about, well, parking, you know, you're gonna have lots of cars there, but then not everybody's gonna be buying food, you know, getting them to have those conversations, but it's about that math and it's getting them that buy-in. How many, you know, are we talking about the number of avocados? Are we talking about the number of pits? Are we talking about the number of rows, the number of columns? There's all sorts of ways we could approach that. Um, and really with the others, you know, if you see this crazy graph, what, what do you know about this? What can you tell us? Um, and getting students to share that information. Today's number, how can we represent this in multiple ways? How else can we say this? Um, so again, quick, a lot of teachers use this at the beginning of class to kind of get, do a quick review, to get them engaged and then diving into some new material, which they can use lots of hands-on things like Liz was saying. You might use counters, you might use algebra tiles, um, the geo boards are great. Um, I'm a big fan of the cues um, and any type of like dice and cards and spinners. All are fun ways to do math and it helps students on adaptive curriculum really, you know, start learning the material and participating in class. And even in high school, when you give counters and tiles and fidget things like this in high school, they still love it. Um, so it's not just while we oftentimes think elementary school, high school students, A, still benefit from it greatly. And, um, and so it, it just benefits everybody there. Science. What do we have for science, Liz? So um, uh, personally, I believe that science should go to the So 
So, um, so again, I look at this and I think this is fifth grade and you have to be able to understand the difference between solid, liquid, and gas. It's actually more complex than that, but the student on gas curriculum tends to be solely working on this piece, the, um, the properties. And, and in this case, you can use the figures, pictures and receiving um, examples too, there in that picture. <laughs> Um, and then for the final sort for assessment, they sorted by history. But we did all that instruction with our concrete examples and with a lot of different pictures so that we're able to sort these pictures for the assessment. Social studies, same kind of things that we were just talking about. Um, there's so many. There's such bad social studies teaching out there. And, uh, and, and Derek and Eric are one of our partners. He is a high school social studies person. And my elementary um, teaching faculty partner that I work, she's a social studies person. And the reality is, if you really teach social studies with good universal design for learning, and you watch the photographs and lots of what we call primary artifacts and statistics, yes, it'll be. A whole lot different. So some of these ideas are really just good ideas for teaching social studies. Great engagement um, things. Like I love, I have who has. So everybody has like this index card in 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 their hand, and you know somebody has to start one that says, um, "I have a piece." You know, what's a piece of land that's surrounded by water on three sides? Everybody's looking at their cards, and somebody's like. I have peninsula and then yep you're right and then they read i have a continent that is also the name of a country and then somebody else says i have australia and again that's a way to engage them to teach them um to re to review um but same thing with kind of the flappables to where you have different vocabulary words you pull it up and it has the definition it might have a picture too um doing uh, the three minute review a teacher just stopping in the middle of a lesson and having students talk what did you just learn what questions do you have getting them to really dive into that information um so all of these are just kind of different ideas that get students engaged in the material the partner the jigsaw everybody's learning partners you know these two people are learning something, the next two people are learning something, and then they teach each other. Um, so doing, doing those group partners or, or jigsaw can be more ways to learn information. The other cool thing with social studies and um, is you can incorporate so many other skills. You can work on those literacy and reading skills within social studies. You can work on, um, it's a great place to work on social skills, um, but map skills, self-determination skills, all of that can be incorporated within this civics, within this government, um, talking about culture and community and family connections, all of that can be integrated within. And, and again, everybody needs it. It's not just students um, that we're supporting or students with disabilities. All kids need to work on their social skills. All kids need to work on their map skills. Um, so it's, it's, it's looking at how can we incorporate and embed these really critical pieces that are going to help everybody within that larger picture of social studies. Every elementary school student must have 90 minutes of limited instruction a day. And they must have 60 minutes of math instruction a day. And for those of you whose child is not in a regular education classroom, you want to check on that because that is state law. And when we have a student who already has difficulty learning, they should be at least getting that much instruction, right? So what we've been doing with the elementary students that we work with is to say, you can teach social studies 
achieving and science achieving within that nine minute block that it was treating in the time of dark and all of that. So, um, you know, that that's just my little soapbox in here about this year. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll talk about it in just a second. Thank you. Um, so peers, we were talking about, you know, utilizing peers within the classroom. They are a natural support, you know, typically in life and in work, we have peers and colleagues that support us. Um, so when we're talking about peers, <clears throat> and for those of you that are parents that are kind of advocating for this peer support, you know, it doesn't have to be the A students that are the peer partners. Actually, those B and C students, it helps build their own self-esteem and their confidence and helps them review course material too. So it's, it's beneficial for everyone. Um, other students you might target too might be those social students in school. You know, the ones that have lots of friends that can pull your child in and have them part of their peer group. Um, so oftentimes, you know, we talk to teachers, paraprofessionals, people that are in the classroom and make, ask them to make recommendations. Who do you think would be a good peer partner? Um, typically you want at least two, because if one's absent, then the other one's there. Um, but, and sometimes you ask students for volunteers, you know, who, who wants to support and provide some assistance or sit next to in the classroom. Um, but the other thing, just a little bit of training needs to be provided of sharing, you know, we're not giving them the answer, but we want to prompt them to see if they can respond, or we want to prompt them to point to their picture. Um, so sometimes we share some of their goals of things, you know, he's going to try to get you to tie a shoe for him, but you prompt him to do it himself, you know, so talking about those high expectations, but teaching them to assist, to model, to tutor, um, and then to share and talk about, hey, don't forget about that social side of things of talking academically. You can review and talk about the academic content, but also talking socially too of, you know, what do you like to do? What, you know, music do you listen to? TV do you watch? Um, videos do you um, go to? So, so getting that social piece in there, especially during breaks or transitions in class, but then also having those academic conversations too. Show their strengths. Um, 
If your child is non-speaking, one of the best things for inclusion is to have a personal communication dictionary. There's a little video you can all can look at, but here's what it makes you do. You keep it with the child. It's about this size. And it's the most important thing that people need to know. So it might say, if I reach my neck out to you, it means come closer, I can talk to you. If I put my head down, it means I'm unhappy about something. Look at my people. Okay. If I if I'm walking on my toes, I had a student that would start walking on his toes because he was starting to get anxious and his anxiety was increasing to where, you know, we needed to take a break or maybe we need to, you know, um, modify something and make it a little less challenging because, you know, again, what are those visual, what are those clues and cues to, to teach us as, as educators, as parents, as peer partners, um what what are some of those signs Or, or 
So, so this is the book I was telling you that the one slide was from. It's more than just being in great, great book for you guys to read, but for you maybe even buy for your teacher. Um, I know Kathy was just talking about that earlier that she gave a copy to her, her teacher who wanted it and has marked it up, but it's a great resource. We just did a book study um, with some teachers in it this earlier in July and um, great strategies. It explains inclusion and how to include students on adapted curriculum and gives a lot of additional resources and information. So definitely check that out. Um, also check out for, again, suggest for the teachers or for you guys at home, but mass.ecu.edu is great on like teaching systematic instruction and providing videos and how to basically how to teach. Um, and so um, same thing with the Thai Center, um, check those out and share them, you know, in nice, subtle, friendly ways of, hey, I was at a conference and learned about these websites. I think they might be great resources for you. Um, but, but yeah, we want to make sure that your students are getting that specially designed instruction within the general education classroom. And within that classroom, they are learning academic skills along with becoming more social and a part of the community within the classroom, the school, and really the world and outside society too. And a lot of times that, that takes those peer supports. Um, and think about, you know, once your student and your child graduate, who's going to be there? You know, we want them to continue on having those peer friendships, but we also want them to continue on and be able to work together and go to college together and um, do all the things that, you know, we do with our friends. And so building those relationships as soon as possible is, is key for that. Does anybody, as we kind of wrap up, we're kind of right on our end, but we were a couple minutes late. Any strategies you guys want to share that you use or seen teachers use or any questions for us? In our last little minute, yes. Just like worksheets, throw them out the window. <laughs>
Have a great day and please feel free to reach out to us if you have any additional questions or need resources please email us thank you charlotte it was so nice that you could join us and our other participants Thank you. I was just I'll let you close okay, it out. Thank and you. Thank you. Thank you.